Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Our guest today is Emilio. Emilio, are you ready to be great today? Yes, we are. Emilio has dedicated the last eight years of his professional career to helping people and organizations do data better. He has a serious obsession with all things analytics, strongly believing that putting data to work can produce change. He has currently grown daily and on the founding team of a second startup in tech, affiliate marketing company. In his downtime, you'll find him watching Formula One or throwing it down the grill. Mio, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. Uh, so, it's a pleasure being here. So let's start with something important. Talk about your grill skills. <laughs> My grill skills. Your grill Man, that, skills. That passion, that passion started maybe almost, I want to say like 10 years ago. You know, it just it started with a, with a small uh, barrel smoker and just went from there. It's been a while, but yeah. So I'm guessing with you being in Florida, you do a lot, a lot of seafood grilling. Or all I don't. Um, so actually, I grew up on the water. I grew up fishing. Uh, I've never liked seafood. Yeah, what? I've never ate seafood my whole life. Yeah, that's hard to believe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and it, it takes a lot to convince me to 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 throw a fish in my grill. <laughs> oh wow! Okay. <laughs> yeah. So what do you usually grill? Like, what is your favorite grill? Or just any kind of meat, pork, chicken? <laughs> Yeah, so, so my favorite's brisket. Yeah, okay, just that, yeah. that's the one that, that got me hooked on was just trying to perfect the brisket. Um, that's, that's definitely so art to yeah. brisket. That's definitely art to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It definitely is. Um, you're not, you're not just no brisket not, in 30 minutes. No, it's not. It's not. It, you're not. And I uh, I just recently graduated to, to a log burner. So it's going it, to, you're on there all day long, every 45 minutes, tending the fire for 18 hours. So, so how often do you get to grill? Um, not as often as I would like. I, I would like to do it more often, but but I'd say at least three or four times a, in a month. Okay, yeah. that's that's decent. Yeah, that's yeah. decent. Yeah. So can you tell us, um, is there a difference between data and analytics or is that the same thing? Uh, data and analytics? Yeah. Um, so so there is, there is a difference. I, th I think in, in general, uh, just like technology so rapidly ex ex came upon us, right? We went from just being able to play music to being able to communicate. The same thing is happening with data and business now. Um, so at the beginning, I would say everybody just, you know, here's your analyst or your business analyst or your data analyst. And that, that person used to wear all the hats. And that's where now the, the industry is changing to where you have your, your data analysts, your data engineers, uh, your data scientists, um, um, just your data architects. And there's all these roles that cover to, to, to build what is like a data analytics function, right? You can't, analytics is, is way down at the line of when you're trying to figure out what's going on in your company, you're trying to visualize that data back to folks. Um, and there's so much more that happens before that just to get to that level. So I, I would say that data analytics in a whole is, is an entire function. And then there's just a lot of roles w within that. Is there a certain degree someone would need if they want to get into this field? I believe there's there's degrees that have come up um, more recently. There is, I, I don't have one. I started my path to going down finance uh, and, and that's how I fell into this. Um, more recently, you'll see you know degrees or certifications mostly in, in data analytics or data science. Um, and it really depends on the route you want to take. If, if you're more on the engineering side, some of those folks come from like a computer science background. Whenever you're doing like integrations between systems or moving data around, um, you have other folks that have like economics and finance backgrounds and, and they start getting more into the analytics. And then and then you have your your data science. Usually they'll come back from background that has to do with math, math mathematicians, arithmetic and stuff like that. So Emilio, when, when two part question, why should an entrepreneur even care about analytics? And should they be a certain size company before they start caring? Yeah, so, so that's a good question. You're never early, it's never too early to, to, to start doing analytics, right? Um, you know, if, if you're a small company and you don't have much data, if, you, if you're seeing you know, 100, 200 maybe users on your website, let's say daily, um, it doesn't hurt, it doesn't hurt to, to, to throw Google Analytics in a tag in your website, understand who the audience is, who the personas, everybody that's coming to you, to your company. Uh, but you, I would stay away from something like data science, something that, that re involves, you know, tens of thousands of dollars just spent to get into. So, so I think it, it, any company at any scale can get into data. It's just what level of data and, and what kind of resources you have. 
but there's always a benefit, right? Just understanding how much your inventory, how much you have in inventory, uh, how much you should have in inventory, your sales. There, there's never uh, not a need for for analytics or, or data in a company. So you got a good point. Like Google Analytics, like hopefully most entrepreneurs know about Google Analytics. So great tool it is. It's free. It does a lot of resources for you, but I mean, it's a lot of information, right? It's a lot of data Google Analytics. Like how does someone like just like deal with all the information coming in? And a tool as simple as Google Analytics, right? How do they deal with that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's a great question. Even to me, uh, every time Google Analytics updates itself, I log in there, I'm like, whoa, what is this entirely new section they throw at me now? Um, the, the best way is to remain focused, right? At the end of the day, you're, you're, you're building an analytics function, not to build an analytics function, but to drive the business. So, so you, there has to be a business question, there has to be a need, something that you can activate on that can improve your business. Um, so if you stay focused, right? If I'm trying to track sales and I'm trying to track one single person, if you stay focused on what it is that uh, on what it is that you're trying to answer in your business, then that helps you understand a tool like Google Analytics, right? Uh, so, so now I'm, I have this one area of focus. I start using that tool. I start learning about that one area of focus, and naturally, I'll start learning all the other possibilities and all the other things that that tool offers. Um, and then eventually, I start before I know it. You know, I'm using a lot more than I thought I was going to use that. Um, but in, in a nutshell, just staying focused, focus on the business, focus on what you're trying to answer, uh, rather than just trying to learn the tool itself. So, Emily, you already answered, already answered some. Can you go in greater detail on the importance of, uh, of analytics and, and data to companies? On the, the points? The, the importance of it. Oh, the importance. Yes. Yeah, so, so I'd say that the biggest importance is, is knowing uh, just knowing more about your business is down to a granular level, right? We're, I like to say, like, we're in a level where um, we're in a year where a lot of things have already been invented. Most small businesses are not inventing something brand new. Uh, you, you just got to figure out how to add treads to that tire to make yourself a, a little better than the next person, right? A little better than the competitor. Um, and this is what, what data really, really allows you to, to pull out, right? Um, without, without, a tool, you know, going back to Google Analytics, if I'm running an e-commerce store as a startup, um, using a simple tool like Google Analytics, I can start seeing, you know, the people visiting my websites, are they males or are they females, right? What, what are the genders? Um, what are the age groups? Uh, I can start tailoring the products that I'm offering on my website based on the age groups that are landing on my website or even tailoring my marketing depending on the age groups that uh, check out the most or, or, or cash, cash out the most. Um, and I, I think that's the importance of data. It's really getting down to understanding your customers and understanding your business at such a granular level um, that, that when you pull levers, changes negative, you correct course and you go back to what you're doing, figure out the next one. So. I think that's the the importance, you know, of data, which, and everybody can benefit from it. It's just really understanding your business at a granular level. Emilio, uh, a little while ago, you had a meeting with Uh It was titled "An Essential Step Most Professionals Overlook in, in the BI2 Implementation." Can you talk about the the background of that article? Yeah. So let me see if I ring my bell real quick. Um, that was the one on the on the people, correct? Yeah. On yeah. skipping people. Yeah. yeah. So so we've. Uh, and this is a mindset that I'm at and, and something that, I, that I've noticed with all the customers that we worked on uh, for due reason that a lot of BI tools, they'll market themselves as like the end all be all, you know, like here's, here's this one BI tool, grab it, you know, you pay a significant amount of money. This tool is amazing. You put it in anybody's hands um, and it's going to work magic. And for the most part, some of the tools are really impressive over other tools. Um, but the, the, the big tools, the good tools, they all, do something similar. Um, they have different ways to end at the same uh, goals that you set for your company. Uh, but we focus so much on those tools and the shiny objects and the shiny marketing that we forget about the people that run the tools, right? At the end of the day, all, all these tools are a shell. They don't have any data in it. They don't have any processes in it. They don't have uh, any of your ETL or your, they're not extracting data for you, transforming it. And they're definitely not doing your analytics for you. Um, so one of the things that I always, always hammer down with companies is to really look at their team internally and make sure that they have the right people in the right places with the right resources to then use that tool um, to, to, to enhance their data maturity, right? And get down that data maturity curve. 
Um, and, and that's the concept of the, the whole article, right? It was, it was focus on your people first, uh, make sure you have the right people in the right roles, uh, and then choose the tool that works for, for the people, for the, for the roles essentially, right? That, that you have to send in the company. Emilio, so hopefully I, hopefully I answered this question right, but what you're doing to me is like big brain stuff, right? When you bring a client, do you ever have to like, it's kind of like quote unquote, dumb it down for them? And if you do have to dumb it down, does that, is that an indicator that it's, it's not the right customer for you? Uh, no, I, I think that's that's the, our sweet spot, right? Our sweet spot are, are the companies that are trying to get into data, um, but don't don't understand it yet, or, or, or there's so much out there. They, they understand the goal, right? They understand where they're trying to get to. They understand what they're trying to measure. Um, they just don't understand how the data gets to gets there, or how to integrate it, how to take two different completely software systems and, and have them talk to each other in the way you need it. Um, and that's 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 my job is to dumb it down, right? To to be that person that has already experienced it with multiple other companies suffering a, a similar issue to them with the new client, and then you know in in a, in a way dumbing it down to where it's just plain English. You know, I need to go here, grab this, move this, and join these two datas without trying to go too into deep as to like how many bytes and and or or, or what kind of language we're we using or what kind of process or anything like that. So for your customers, is there any kind of minimum requirement? Like for me, at Kevin's HR, if someone doesn't have a website, you know, they're probably not for us, right? Or if they're scared of tech, they're probably not for us, right? Is there just like minimum requirements before you even talk to a customer, potential customer? Um, not, not to talk to them. I think what we like doing is we do like a discovery phase up front uh, where we, we try to blueprint the, the lay of the land, right? So if what, what is it that you're trying to answer? Let's pick one project as an example. Tell me what you're trying to answer. And then we'll do what we call like a blueprint exercise uh, where we'll walk through the different the different silos of data where, where they think it lives. Uh, and then we try to like estimate or, or figure out exactly how it is that, that we're going to get that data from, from where it is originally to where we want it to go in that one session um, at a very high level, right? Not, not detailed. And from that, we kind of, we we set the stage to to really show them okay you know what what you what you're trying to do is possible or isn't possible right if it is possible then we give them really high level steps of so these are the steps that need to get accomplished so before they they even commit to us or before we even work with them we try to really uh, uh, set expectations on on how long it could take any of the possible uh, blockers that we may have what may deter them from wanting to to move forward so we try to be very clear clear about that before moving forward so i don't i don't we've never had to like personally turn away anybody ourselves um i, I think the, the the leads or the potential clients kind of do that themselves so I have to assume, presume there's like numerous tools for this, right? Is there any favorite tools that you use that you'd like to recommend to people? Yeah, so, so there are numerous. Um, our, our favorite one nowadays is Domo. Uh, one of the biggest reasons for that is is we are we work out of Miami, Florida. None of our clients um, are this far south. Uh, so, so we work remotely for the most part. Uh, and Domo is the one BI tool that is, is, is true SaaS offering where everything's online. Um, and it, and it makes it really easy for us to work with and interact with our clients. Uh, on top of it, makes it really easy for them to, to interact and maintain uh, their data clean in, inside of Domo. That, that's our favorite. I mean, there's a, there's a whole other laundry list of reasons we, we, we prefer Domo, but that's, that's our first go-to. And, and how long did it take you all to figure out this was, this was your favorite? Like, did you like, do you like a lot of hidden misses with different companies or do you yeah. actually up here to this one? What's the process? Yeah, so, on that? so Originally, when I started getting into data, I started like most people with Excel. Um, and then I was at the time I was working at NIH and I was lucky enough to be part of this program they had where where I joined the team to, to help implement a, a BI tool at NIH. Um, and I had the opportunity there to see most notably was Tableau and ClickView at a high level from from a data visualization standpoint. Uh, and I started getting some experience with Tableau, started getting some experience with ClickView. Originally, Dasly started just working within within ClickView, uh, and we we enjoyed it for the most part. There was a lot changing in 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 the world of, of BI at the time. And then one of our clients, the CEO, went out and bought Delmo and and came back to us and was like, "Hey, there's this new tool. I like it. You guys should use it." Uh, and and that's how we started. And then we just found that all the other tools, you know, we did we do work in Power BI. We still do some work in Tableau and ClickView. Um, 
and then we, we get requests from clients to, hey, can you do this for me? Can you set up uh, emailed alerts? And, and our question is like, yes, we can, but we have to create a custom script and that script is going to go to a custom SMTB box. And be, so it always becomes like all these little hurdles, hurdles that we need to cross. Uh, and then we, when we started getting Domo, we would get the same questions. And then I was like, oh, you know what? Domo has that. I can set it up for you quickly. Uh, and, th and that's really how we ended up with Domo. Now, it's, it's not the only tool we use. Uh, we definitely use other tools depending on, on the client's needs or even for ourselves if we're doing like any kind of data, uh, heavy data processing. Uh, but it's, it's the tool that we lean towards. So Emilio, when should or should a company ever consider should it like hiring their own internal data science person? Yeah, so I think the that, that kind of goes to our name too, right? Um, so what we try to do at DAS is a data as a service, like here when you need us, here when you don't. Um, my idea or my I ideal client, I guess we can start there, is is a company looking to start in a data program, right? It's they're, they don't have the full budget for a full team yet. They understand that they want to do it, that they understand the benefits, um, but they don't want to go out from day one and hire a manager, an analyst, an engineer, and a, and a developer. Um, right there, you're, you're covering four, four FTEs. So what we help these companies do is we bring the team, right? The team is outsourced to us. We help uh, set up the strategy. We help set up, you know, we've done it so many times for other companies that we know where, where not to do or what not to try anymore, right? Or, or what paths to go. Then once we get you going and we get you down a good uh, maturity path uh, in your data program, uh, those companies, our, our, our ideal client would then start hiring the their own internal team, right? And it's kind of like an like a handing off. We start give, telling, letting them know, okay, this is how we accelerate up the curve. Here's the build out. This is our strategy. This is how we implement it. And slowly we can transition from being outsourced to us to their internal team. Um, now the benefit to doing it this way is we're, we're still around, right? We're, we're not going anywhere. We may lose, uh, you know, we may not be called on as much um, but in the event that, that that company loses a few members of their team or has a project that they need more uh, help with, we're already here. We already understand your data and we can get spun up real quickly. Uh, to, I think I had remember reading a while back that it takes about six to seven months for an analyst just to understand the data of a company um, or just to understand how they're storing their data, understand. But because we helped you initially start that strategy. We did the foundation. We typically are still somehow engaged. We'll meet once a month, understand what projects you have going. So we'll always be here when you need more uh, need more resources. Emil, is there a difference between like marketing data, sales data, HR data, or is data just the same across the board? Um, so, so, so I, I wouldn't say that data, the information is the same. Data is the same, right? The way you store the data, whether it's columns or rows or, or JSON objects or how, how you store the data, how we manipulate it, how we, we, we uh, deliver it back and visualize it, that all stays for the most part the same. What changes is then the, the information that you're deriving from it. So the, the KPIs, the metrics, uh, for example, your, your sales and your marketing team may use the same data and just get completely different KPIs, right? It's a number of sales, number of sales per rep um, versus, uh, you know, your conversion rate, number of leads to sales. You know, do I push more of what type of leads so it gets to the sales floor? Uh, and then on your other end, you have your workforce management folks, you know, is marketing pushing too many, too many leads that and we need to hire more sales reps. So that they're all using the same data in different ways or looking at it from different angles. So the importance is to make sure your data is clean. Uh, so then all your different departments are, are getting different information from the same data. So I'm, I'm probably saying this wrong, but I think they're saying that like with stats, you know, you can manipulate stats to like make it say whatever you want to say, like it makes everyone it it be a liar of truth that's just manipulated. Can, I'm guessing data can be manipulated the same way? Yeah, a hundred percent. That's then that's, uh, you know, it's the same as stats, even your visualizations, right? If depending on what scale your visualizations that something may pop up or something may just look flat on a, on a line chart, for example. Um, and it's not uh, within business, like most of the times that you see, you won't see it manipulated uh, kind of like in a malice way, but it'll be manipulated in a, in, you know, just from inexperience. 
and by the time you you figure out that those issues, right? If you're sitting at a meeting and, and you you're seeing the data in front of you, you're seeing the dashboard, you're making decisions based on those dashboards. Uh, but it's not you don't have the time to go and ensure that the data is clean, that the data is accurate. And you, you'll see it a lot of the times where uh, the company makes the wrong decision, uh, starts going the wrong direction just because the data was was manipulated the wrong way uh, and it was giving them the same results. Um, something as easy as, you know, interpreting seconds as minutes or something, you know, something like that. And it just completely throws everything off. So Amelia, right now, like in the workforce, we have like all these generations, like baby boomers, generation X, millennials, generation Z, generation whatever's coming up. And you might not know the answer to this, but do you find like different generations are more open to data and analytics or, or is more opposed to it or? Yes, I, I do run across this a lot. Um, they're, for the most part, they're all open to it, it would be my, uh, my feedback on there. The way they ingest it is significantly different. Um, where you see a lot of the younger generation that they're, they're completely okay with, with having a chart, setting up a notification or an alert that unless my phone rings, I don't, I don't even go look at my dashboard. I don't care to dig into it. I just want to let me know if something crosses X. Um, and then the older generations, you get more into like the finance type structure and reporting where they really like tabular, right? It, the data comes across, uh, uh horizontally, um, <laughs> And it, it makes it it makes it hard it makes it hard to work with both those structures right whether your data is stored horizontally or stored vertically uh, it makes it hard to to work between both of them so the way they ingest the way they 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 process data you can see the generational differences. So how do you become so fascinated with this field? What started you on this journey? Yeah, this is a funny one. Um, so I had, I had gotten out of the military. Uh, I met my wife, girlfriend at the time. We moved to D.C. I was going to school. Um, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I, I always knew I wanted to be some sort of an entrepreneur. I wanted to try something on my own. Um, so I was just going to school and then my wife gets home one day. I didn't have a job. Uh, she gets home one day with a newspaper uh, and just kind of pointed out that uh, that data was the future and that the NIH was having a hiring fair. I think she was uh, trying to tell me something there. So, this uh, little hint. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I went to that hiring fair and, and I got hired um, at NIH while I was still studying finance. Um, and then I just, it just stuck to be in the back of my mind that in that paper she read that said that data was the future. Um, and then I remember that one of the taglines they had was some people get it and some people don't. Um, and then I started to quickly notice that, that, I, that I, I was able to see rows and columns of data and just quickly understand how to transform it, how to manipulate it to, to deliver the results or deliver the, the answers to the questions that people were asking. Um, and that tagline kept sticking on the back of my mind. So I just continued down the path. Um, and, and this is where I am today. It just got deeper and deeper into it and, and went more and more into to the engineering side. So you just, it was just natural to you, just clicked and, and it's gone wrong from there. Yeah, it just clicked. It just clicked. I, uh, I, I would do things. I would, I would build out these like very overly thought ex, uh, Excel dashboards inside of Excel. Um, and then later I would, I would, I would run across an article that would tell me what the term was to what I had discovered on my own, but I wish I could have just, I sh should just Googled it earlier. Uh, only if I knew that term. Um, and it just, it just came natural. It came natural. And I really enjoyed figuring out uh, the issues that people were having or, or getting people to access the information that they couldn't, um, well, you know, my bosses at the time. And it just kind of became a passion of mine to, 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 to play with, with it. Can you tell us something about how, how being in the military has helped you be an entrepreneur? Yeah. So, so I think the, the, the biggest takeaway I got from the military is, is being a lot more outgoing and confident, right? I, I don't think I was that confident in myself or my abilities before the military. Um, it was really after the military where, where I definitely got a lot more confidence to, to try to do an entrepreneurship or, or, or just take risks, put myself in situations where, where I don't feel comfortable um, and, and seeing how I come out on the, out on the other end. Uh, I still get super nervous before I go into the situations, uh, uh, but afterwards, it's you know, it, I, you know, I did what I needed to do, and I, I think that was the biggest takeaway I had from the military um, was just the confidence uh, and, and just 
meeting different people, right? Meeting different people, getting to see everybody from different backgrounds, uh, that that really pushed me towards, you know, helping me be an entrepreneur. Um, I more so, I'd say the military extremely helped me in, in data, right? It's I always had an OCD personality or I've always wanted perfection, uh, but I never knew if it was the right thing or not. And then I remember that just being one of the things in the military, like, you know, everything had to be dress right dress, everything had to be clean, everything had to be by a certain way. Um, and then I remember reading, I think it was Colin Powell's book where he mentions uh, that, you know, you, you don't be that person that walks by a little piece of trash on the floor and leaves it there right? Because anything that's out of place could just trickle down. Um, and that's one of the biggest things in data is just making sure that everything's balanced, that everything's accounted for, that your governor's, governance is in place. Um, and th those are all traits that I think I really acquired from the military, uh, that it wouldn't be where I am today without it. So, so Mila, we're, we're data analytics, you know, all that kind of stuff, data science. I think the stereotype is people working with like nerdy, geeky, you know, like, you know, in the corner by themselves, hacking yeah. away. Is that stereotype true? Um, I don't, I don't know if I would say it's true. It, it, it is dominant. There is a lot, right? It's, you get a lot of introverts. You get a lot of introverts, people that, that, that are just fascinated with uh, figuring things out or, or, or tinkerers, right? And the tinkerers in the digital, in the digital age, I like to think about it. Um, one of the biggest things about running a data team is making sure that they don't go down a rabbit hole, you know, and they go too far that they're not being productive. Um, but but I don't I don't think it's a I think the times are changing, right? Times are changing, especially, and people are noticing that the benefits there's the demand is so high and there's not enough supply, and you have so many people from different backgrounds coming in and, and understanding the benefits of data. Um, so I think that the the persona is definitely changing to who is a data uh, data type person, but but it's still pretty pretty nerdy and pretty introverted field, that's for sure. So for the people on your team, like you just said, you know, keep them going on down rabbit holes. How do you keep them like keep them down going down rabbit holes and, and balancing the data versus the business case and taking care of the company you're, you're dealing with? Yeah, so, so it's just project management. You know, you have combine board. We we when we we try to do discovery as much as possible on all our tasks. Once if we have a good set of, of requirements, a good set of rules that we're what we're trying to build or what we're trying to achieve, um, and then setting deadlines. Right, as soon as you have those deadlines, go over them once a week in stand up meetings, uh, and I, I think that's what keeps us on track. So you're you're still allowed to go down your rabbit holes so long as we're we're meeting our clients' expectations as as a turnaround times. Um, like you know, a lot of these people. They're very intrigued with information or understanding things. So you'll still find them going down rabbit holes. I actually had one of my guys, I, I go and he like pushed to change at like three in the morning. I was like, what are you doing up at three in the morning? Uh, and he's like, yeah, you know, that, that one project that we finished and we delivered, uh, but it was still like in back of his mind, this one little thing that he wanted to perfect. So he went back at three in the morning later that night and, and, and fixed it. So it's it's finding the right people that that understand that you still we still have to deliver, uh, but they have enough of a passion and enough of a uh, attitude towards the what they're doing that they continue to do it on their own time and to learn for themselves. So like so I'm an introvert myself, and I know a lot of introverts like we they think we think, but we don't say what we, need, what we need to say right. How do you make sure that your introverts actually speak up and talk when they like need has some a value to add instead of like keeping themselves? Yeah. Um, I think that's a hard one to overcome in all fields. I try to ask a lot of questions, right? If, if I try to to get the, them to confirm to me or, or, or say back to me, okay, this is what I want. Can you tell me what I want um, and, and make sure that it, that it's there? But but that that's a hard one, you know, because even, even then sometimes you'll ask and you'll ask and they're like, no, I got it or I'm good and it won't come out. Um, and then you, you sometimes you find yourself a little delayed on projects because of that. Um, yes. Yeah, so, I, mean, I don't think I've found the perfect solution there yet. <laughs> yeah. So Amelia, I, I don't know if you're hiring or anything like that, but if you were hiring, what would you look for in a data science or analytics person? Yeah. Uh, so what would I, I think the most thing I would look for is somebody that's eager to learn, somebody that that has a hunger for information, has a hunger to grow. Um, 
you know, there's, it's always nice to find somebody that has a background in, in say like SQL or has a background in, in, in a specific data visualization tool or something like that. But I think some of the best hires or some of the best people that I've worked with, they started from somebody that, that wasn't a business role or wasn't a developer role. And, and they somehow they were tasked with, with an analytical project by their boss because they trusted them enough or thought they were capable of doing it. Um, and then they find themselves down a very unfamiliar path and somehow figure it out, right? It, it may not be the best solution or it may be very manual of a solution, but they figure it out. Um, and then that's where that hunger starts to for data and information and, and being analysts, uh, not necessarily uh, somebody that went and got a certificate in, in, in doing SQL, right? That And that's what I look for in resumes. I look for people that have different backgrounds, different experiences, um, and then they really seem like they like data and they like figuring things out. So Emilio, like if you're a software developer, you can either go, you know, get a four year degree from a four year school or go to a six month card academy. Is it the same thing for data science analytics? You get a four year degree or go to some kind of data science coding academy? Um, so, so I don't, I know there's a few data science coding academies, right? I, I know down where I'm at, there's a few what they'll call like data analytics or, or, or just a data coding academy, but they're all, they're all data science based, right? They're all in the predictions using R models and Python um, and, and getting more from like away from the traditional just reporting. Um, is there a difference? It, it's hard for me to say just because I, I never did that. And I didn't do the traditional uh, four year degree in, in analytics or anything of that sort. Uh, finance kind of touched on on KPIs and, and figuring out numbers, but, but not analytics per se. Um, what, what I could tell you is towards more recently in Dastly, we've leaned more toward doing web development as well. Um, and I didn't want to take the company in that direction without knowing what I, what I needed to know or, or knowing a little bit about it. So I took 10 weeks off and I did a coding bootcamp, um, not in data, but just in web development. Um, and coming out of that boot camp, I could see where my personality, if I would have done that boot camp for 10 weeks when I was younger and started off as a developer, I probably would have ended up farther faster than going and doing four year degree in, in, in computer science. I don't think that that, that would work for everybody. Um, but, but I do think there's value in those schools, depending if you're the right personality, if you're the right go-getter, that you're always gonna continue learning and be a self-starter. I, I think those boot camps are, are an excellent choice. Emilio, you're in the Miami, Florida, correct? Correct, yeah. So like Miami, I know has like a grown tech scene, growing star scene, but I don't think it's on the level of Austin, Seattle, the Bay Area, or New York City yet. Correct. Having said that, yeah. what, have, have, what have been the advantage or disadvantage of doing a tech company there in Miami? Um, I think the biggest advantage is the weather, right? Uh, it's, it makes hiring easier, that's for sure. Um, but the, the, I, I liked the feeling, like you said, it, it's not like an Austin or San Francisco or anything like that yet. yet. Um, but but it, being part of something new, right? It, it's kind of why I like Dastly too, of being part of something new continuously, continuously starting from scratch. Um, when I went to this coding boot camp, I got really in touch with with the local entrepreneurs more so and, and startups. And it's just interesting to see everybody that's that's coming here now, right? I, I think it was uh, not Sequoia. There's one there's a big uh, VC firm up in New York that's just moving their headquarters down here. They, they purchased land and they're building, you know, a, a high rise as a huge incubator down here. Um, Spotify just bought, I think it was like 20,000 square foot office space next to that incubator. We work is across the street. Um, there's, there's all kinds of buildings popping up now where it's, it's like shared workspaces below downstairs and upstairs is the apartments for the shared workspaces. So, so I, I think it's a great city for, for entrepreneurship, especially in tech. Um, there's a lot of movement going on. There's a lot of people in the community pushing for it. Um, and I'm hoping I'm hoping it expands. I think Miami, Miami really needs a new industry uh, outside of, of, of tourism. Um, and I think this could be it. Yeah, I was this, this is a new social media app called Clubhouse. I was on there a couple of days ago, like, like do different rooms. And I got invited to a room called a uh, Miami startup culture, right? And there was like 300 people on the like different people talking about the movement to Miami. And one VC said, we're just, we're just moving there because Miami's like a gateway to Latin America, right? 
yeah and the tech yeah that, that's a that's a huge thing too yeah that's the, it's that gateway there's a lot of south american companies that headquarters are in miami um we're actually starting to work here in the next couple of months with with a, a mexican firm that has a, a u.s uh part to it too and, and part of the way we landed that deal was uh domo didn't have any other partners that spoke spanish um so just we naturally like ding, just ding, landed ding. i'm your guy yeah right we're, we're, <laughs> we're, landed we're the your deal. company exactly yeah yeah and they, and they already outsourced to a lot of other companies in miami so it naturally it does become a gateway and, and when you look and you travel to south america and central america a lot um you can see where they're 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 I wouldn't it's just some, some countries countries are behind when it comes to the technology just when you see like you know, the registers or the way they use data the way they do marketing digital marketing um, application development um, they're just one step behind the way the US is doing it so I can see where where where, where companies are going to want to cater to that market from Miami is data done different in different countries or is it just all the same it's all the same. That's that's the funny part. Uh, that's what I like about data. It's it's a universal language. The way some metrics are calculated may be slightly different, um, but in a in a general sense, you know, the way the the company that we're working with here soon is is in the uh, operation space, like in in, in in warehouses, and and reviewing their requirements and their needs. Where the almost exactly the same to another company that we worked with that's just U.S. based. Um, so, you know, your, your, your impressions, your clicks, when it comes to marketing, your impressions, your clicks and conversions, bounce rates, all that, all those metrics are still universal, no, no matter what country you're in. Emilio, is your wife involved in your company too? She is, she is. So she, she's uh, one of our co-founders. She runs all the uh, administration operations, ensuring all our, our documents, security, all that stuff is good to go in the project management. So hopefully the next question doesn't get you in too much trouble. Are you talking about the pros and cons of running a company with your spouse? Yeah, the pros and cons. Uh, so, so I'll start with the cons. I think the cons are work doesn't work doesn't end. It's 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 hard sometimes to to make a you know okay work ended now. Let's stop talking about it, right? It's especially on the days you're you're excited, or the days you're not. The good thing is you're you're also sharing those ups and downs with your spouse, right? Um, you know your heart's in it when you're both doing it. You know, you're not, you have everything to lose now because you don't have multiple income streams, right? Um, that's one of the downfalls, but especially in the stage we're at, um, but it, but it's definitely been a positive thing, being able to share the experience with somebody that close to you um, and being able to have somebody right across that you trust uh, has been great. Yes. And so this is your, sec your second startup, right? Your second company? So this was, uh, so this is essentially the first one. Um, okay. And then we've had, we've had a couple throughout the, throughout the time in between um, where we weren't as dedicated or we were trying two at a time kind of thing. Uh, this is the one that just kept uh, pervading all the time. Okay. Yeah. So what, what, what makes entrepreneurship so like, so fascinating to you? Like why, why be an entrepreneur? Um, to, to me, I think it's, it's the freedom. Um, and and I don't mean I don't mean the freedom of going on vacation when I wanted to because you'll quickly find out you have a lot of bosses, um, but the freedom to be able to make your own decisions on who you work with and when you work with them, how you work with them, um, being able to, to 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 work with so many different companies instead of just one company because I'm I'm, I'm driving myself as to towards what I want to do, um, and that's what I love the most about it. Uh, second to that is 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 the being able to give other people jobs, being able to create other jobs. That's something that I really enjoy. Um, you know, and, and third to that is the economic value uh, advantage, right? If, if we make it, I'm hoping to, to retire early, <laughs> earlier than, than, than not. So I, I think those are the three main drivers to, to wanting to be an entrepreneur. Is it amazing to me, people say I must have my own business because I don't want a boss. Like that I realize that you have more bosses, right? Your employees, are your boss, your customer, your boss, your vendors, are your boss. And a lot of people don't realize yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. That definitely happens. And, and I think to another level, I always wanted to please my boss. I always wanted to make sure my boss and my team looked good. Um, and when I went and started doing this on my own and now I realize 
I really do. And now, and I even now I want to make you look even better because I want to make sure that I that 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 our contracts stay that you get as much value as as you think you deserve. Um, so yeah, you you definitely have a lot of bosses. Yeah. Can you talk more detail about how your company got started, your vision for it, and all, all that kind of stuff? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. So it's so Dastly started just uh, just over six years ago now. So you know, I said I always wanted, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but I wasn't sure in water what I wanted to do. Um, so in 2014, uh, the company I was working for through a series of events, I, I was lucky enough to to become a 1099 contractor with them. Um, with the understanding that that I am going to start my own business, um, so so that gave me a lot of freedom to be able to go out and, and think, what is it that I want to offer? What is it that I can bring to market uh, within the same realm? Right at the time, I was working as a BI manager within the same realm of what I was doing, uh, and then I, I started to realize that that repeatable need, right? Um, all these organizations I had worked with up to the time, they wanted to they wanted it to 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 start a data program. They wanted to, to get more information and leverage their data, um, but they would always underestimate the staff required. And then that, you know, they would put all that effort into buying the best tool. They would get the best tool, put it in the hands of their current sales folks or their current leadership, um, and then let that play out for a couple of months up to upward to an year, a year and notice that they weren't getting the value that they needed or the value that they expected back. Uh, and then that's where we would come in, right? Uh, somebody would refer to me, I would, I would come in by myself and help them set up that data strategy. Uh, and then most of the time you would notice the companies that were really dedicated to it and had the funding, they would put the budget, implement the plan, go out, hire three to four people for this team, start it up and get going. The other companies would just kind of let it go out and die and continue to, to operate uh, from the hip because they didn't have that money to invest. And that's where the idea came to start pushing Dastly in this direction where I could I could build my own team where I had analysts, data scientists, developers, Python developers, JavaScript developers, where I had all these different hats that I can wear. I had my team that does things my way when it comes to data. Uh, and then these, these companies that didn't quite have the budget but wanna get started today would reach out to us. You know, we were your fly by night uh, data team, full service understanding that you didn't always need a developer full-time or you maybe not always need the engineer full-time. Um, so we would work out the retainer projects to where you only use us as much as you need us to get to achieve your goals and we pull back when you don't need to. Um, and that's that's really how we started. That's how everything started picking up, how the process started becoming uh, repeatable, how I was able to, to start focusing on who the ideal clients were and started focusing on where I wanted to work in what area. Um, and that, that's, that's what brought us to, to today. And what's, so, your, what's your vision? Like you want to be the number one data company in the United States, number one data company for like certain type of businesses. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know if I have a, a certain goal for that moment. Right. I, I think my longest term goals are, are just within the next two, three years. Um, I think to say that to be the number one, you know, something like the number one company in data, it, it, it's hard because there's so many different avenues. There's so many different things that you can focus on within within data. I think for, for right now, my goal is just to continue growing the way we've been growing, uh, continue to serve our, our clients as, as best as we can, uh, keep them happy and, and see where we go from there. Emilio, is there a limit on the number of companies you can handle or is that unlimited? Um, there is a limit. So, so right now, I think we're like we're two, three months out from being able to take new work in um, as we try to scale. So that's that's another end where it's a little bit difficult is is trying to balance the the full timers on our side versus the contracts coming in, uh, and then ensuring that we can rotate people around different contracts enough so we all have knowledge of all our clients' data. Emilio, do you have like a perfect customer? And if you do, how do you how do you find them? uh how we find them I'm, I'm still looking i'm still trying to figure that one out that's for sure um so so our our perfect com customer is is uh, our, our ideal customer is, is somebody that understands the value of data that understands how they can do better when they when they see the data and see the information that their company is giving them or telling them um and that they're 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 open open to to giving things time to to build out uh 
really solid foundational programs revolving their data strategy uh, and moving on from there is that that's our ideal customer somebody that's that, that's grounded and understands the benefits so obviously it's not the same thing but if you bring on someone to your seo the seo person always tells you hey it's it's no quick fix it's going to take six months a year i'm presuming the same way with what you do right it's not a quick fix right it's going to take the time to get everything up to speed with, your, with the company you bring on Correct. Yeah, it, it does. It takes time to get up to speed uh, where, where it differs a little bit uh, from something like SEO is that every time you tweak something in SEO, it then takes, you know, every new project takes X amount of months. What 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 I try to drive in really deep to when we first started in a project or a data project is the more time we spent up front on the foundation and, and figuring out the strategy, then every project after that becomes faster. Because once you once you build your first dashboard, every dashboard after that within that same vertical of the company becomes just an offshoot of the of the first one, right? So because we we load all your data first, we cleanse all your data, clean all your data, get everything ready, and then you can start building out analytics and building out dashboards quicker. Um, you're just gonna have what seems uh, like just background work for for the first six seven months, the minimum. Emilio, how do you prevent information overload? Um, that, that's the, that's a, that's one that, that we fight all the time. So the way we prevent it is, is not to put too much in, in a dashboard, right? It, our ideal dashboards will not have more than four metrics on them. Um, they won't have more than five or six visualizations and then that's on the heavy side. Uh, so it's, it's a matter of building your dashboards to where they tell a story and they take down, uh, they take the, the users down a, a path. To, to guide them through the, their different KPIs and what they're looking for within the company, uh, rather than just giving them one man. The key to, to, to the information overload. So Amelia, you talked about this a little bit already, but can you talk more detail? Why would I come to even want to outsource this? Cause it's like, you know, something that's important. They want to do it internally. They will not want to trust like an outside company. Why should they outsource this? Yeah, so so I, I think the biggest benefit to outsourcing is, is just the, the the speeding up, right? It's it's expensive. D data people are expensive. Hiring data engineers are expensive, um, and in hiring somebody like us, we've worked with so many different companies. We've implemented and integrated with so many different tools that that whenever you you want to change your HR system, for example, or you want to change your, your your CMS or your CRM we already have that knowledge using those other CRMs or CMSs. We, we're not starting from scratch. Um, so we can either help guide your, your internal teams, we can take care of the work ourselves or do it between, right? So I, I think that's the biggest benefit to outsourcing. Um, and then the a second benefit to that is there's, there's a lot of things in data. As much as you automate data, there's always some kind of manual process or things break, things change. Um, and, and some of the smaller teams you do transition, right? You grow up, you get your staff gets another a job offer and they leave. Um, they take all that knowledge with them. A lot of that knowledge, and especially in the data the data realm is inside our heads. Um, so this is a way to, to ensure kind of like a safety that, that we're always going to be here to pick up the slack if anything ever happens internally or, or we need to augment your staff. So I have to manage those like hundreds, probably thousands of sources to get information on data analytics, data science, you know, how do you keep up to date with all this stuff? Yeah, there's a lot. Um, so, so the way we keep up to date is, is mostly through our clients, right? Our, our, our clients are always moving around using different tools and, and, and whatever tools they send us to, uh, that, that's usually how we'll keep up to date. Um, other than that, I, I try to stay up if there's any kind of new HR systems that are coming out or there's any kind of CRMs that are, that are, are, are starting to be like known or, or starting to say Salesforce competitors or something like that. Um, we'll kick the tires on them. We'll, we'll look at them, look at their data models, trying to understand the data a little bit, but it, it definitely is hard until some, until we're hired to, to figure out how to integrate with a specific tool. It, it's hard because every, every tool produces data. Um, so that th there's thousands of endpoints points and thousands of capabilities. Yeah, sometimes it's like there's 10 new HR systems every day. Seems, seems like sometimes. Yeah, yeah, especially in the HR world. And I'm sure you're aware there's there's a lot. Is You get into recruiting, you get into, there's just, just, especially on the recruiting side, there's a lot of data collected there. And um, and just a matter of keeping it clean is that's that's one of the hardest things on, on the HR side is, is keeping the data clean uh, and then keeping it secure, making sure that the right 
people uh, can access the data and then the wrong people never can. Emilio, I understand you have a gift for our listeners today. Uh, yes. So if you're listening today, we're, I'm open to, 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 to give you some free consultations. So if you reach out to us, if you have any idea, if, you, if you're a smaller company or mid-sized company, you're, you're, you're looking to get into your data program, um, or if you're looking to do a, a web development program or web development software or anything like that, reach out to us. We'll give you a, a free consultation. Um, I'll help you blueprint out your idea, figure out what it is that you're, you're trying to to achieve and, and then we can kind of guide you from there and tell you what what you should look for what to be careful with and, and and so on and and if we could help where we could help so can you give us your social media for yourself and your, and your company so people can reach out to you yeah that's a good one you know i don't even know if i know that off the top of my head <laughs> i think linkedin is the only one we have okay well, i'll just put the links in there no. for you okay yeah, that's that's the uh, that's the other benefit of of having a co-founder. She handles <laughs> a lot of that. She handles a lot of that stuff. It's so much information. I I switch yeah, my I, mind. I'll, I'll put links in there for you. Uh, and okay, to, thank you and, so much. Yeah, and to a listener, we have the link to his a uh, gift and social media links on the show notes. You can find the show notes at www.kevinshallblog.com. Be sure to share this episode with your friends. So, um, Amelia, we'll come to the end of our talk. Can you give us any advice on wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Um, I think I think the, the what I can leave everyone with is is you know the biggest takeaway is understanding that data is the future, information is the future. The more you know about your customers, the more you know about your employees, um, the better it is and the easier it is to run a company. Uh, and it's never too early to start. It's never too early to start thinking about your company or thinking about your startup, thinking about what KPIs you want to achieve, how to move that needle. Um, down to that granular level. That's that's the biggest piece of advice. I, I wished even when I started my company and it was a data company, I, I wasn't setting KPIs and I wasn't setting goals for myself. Um, and I wish I, I, I did that from the start. Emilio, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Yep, thank you. Have a good day. And to our, and to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.